Hello, my name is Ginger Sumito, and I live in Siskiyou County, a very rural area um, in the northernmost county in California. I'm a statistician by trade with other, over 30 years in the federal government, and I deal with facts and data. And I'd like to share some of the facts and data about the organized crime and the environmental consequences to this rural area because of these criminal elements. On a daily basis, we have seen transporting of chemicals in differing, differing containers, whether 55 gallon drums or the five gallon, 10 gallon containers stacked upon one another, transported down the road in trucks, in cars, and sometimes commercially delivered. The, the chemicals are usually transported to a greenhouse on every one of the parcels. And these temporary greenhouses are made either constructed out of wood or constructed out of PVC with plastic sheathing. They sometimes push the brush up on the sides to create a barrier so that there's a protection against um, people that may spot their operations. Once the containers reach the site, they're placed in the most convenient location for the user. These locations can be out in the sun, full sun, um, in some kind of overhang, but undoubtedly they never have a spill contained area, a spill control. So this, the chemicals have the ability to reach the ground. Also, because there is an environmental exposure to wind and sun, the labels sometimes blow off. And so now you have an unknown chemical in a container. Um, and it may be directly adjacent to another uh, unknown, which may be a flammable. So now you have some hazards and on the ground um, to both the applicator and to anybody that enters that site. The chemicals come in several different sizes and they're distributed across sites, some in concentrated areas in which you have flammable and non-flammable um, containers and apparatuses such as this. There is several different uh, containers of several different chemicals, um, some known, some unknown, and propane tanks stored in the same area. Sometimes the chemicals are stored physically out in the sun along with the propane and the gas containers and adjacent to one another, let, letting it be a, a volatile situation for not only the person that's uh, living on the site, but anybody that visits this site. Every site in the 3,000 locations has chemicals. Combine all these chemicals in our water system and you have a catastrophic event to the environment, to the wildlife, to the people, to the survival of this basin. This is a listing of the type of chemicals used in cannabis cultivation in California and can be found in a pocket guide of pesticides um, from California State. I'd like to just go through a few of these. Not only does the poison that's put out to target a particular parasite that the grower doesn't want, it also is a, uh, kills the other animals that may feed upon it. In this case, we have birds and bees, rodents that are killed um, but the consequences of their kill may affect the other animals that feed upon them, such as uh, a pair of wolves that has been introduced into the area. Now they have the potential to be killed because of the uh, carcasses left behind. Um, unknown consequences because of their actions. One in particular chemical that has been found here has been outlawed in, in California and has been known to kill um, 
even a bear with a single teaspoon, much less a wolf that may be feeding off the carcass. Um, unintentional victims to um, their operation. In order to facilitate the 24 hour operations to maximizing the growing capacity of the greenhouses, all of the sites have generators. And these generators are, uh, have undoubtedly have no spill control. So what you have is uh, petroleum spilled on the ground and most of the locations um, and leached into the water's table from that. Again, the containers are out in the open in the environment with labels that may or may not stay adhered to the container itself, lending itself to a very volatile situation, an unknown situation for anybody that enters this site. In order for the growers to facilitate the 24 hour operations that they have to maximize the growing time and season, they use generators and they stockpile their petroleum products in barrels and in cans on their sites, exposing the uh, wildlife to the contaminants of petroleum. But not only do the wildlife have that to contend to, but they also have the sound of the generators themselves. The generators can be heard up to 20 miles from the sites. These generators disrupt the owl's ability to detect their prey. They, they also disrupt the breeding between these owls. And we, as residents of this community and of this area, have seen a significant decline in the owl population over time. And we can only contribute that to the illegal operations. And this is an environmental consequence of their operations. An additional environmental consequence is human waste. Each site has the individuals that are living on the site tending their greenhouses or cultivational areas. They have no permits that which you can put a septic system in to deal with the refuge human waste and instead run it directly onto the ground where it is a safety issue for themselves and other people in the area. Another means of waste disposal found on the growing sites are the cubic water containers. These cubical water storage containers are about a quarter of an inch thick with a metal grating around the outside edge. They're placed in the ground, the human waste is put in them and they stay in that condition. Um, it is estimated that these plastic containers will last anywhere from four to 500 years. The environmental consequences from not utilizing proper sanitation disposal is exposure to the waste and the diseases that is contained in the waste and transmitted from that waste, not only to the groundwater, but to the people on the, on the site and via vectors such as flies and mosquitoes that may have come in contact with the waste on that site. Improper trash disposal is another environmental consequence as a result of the criminal activities in this area. Trash is either placed in pits, placed in holding holes, or just left in piles. In this particular area in Siskiyou County, we have extreme wind events a downslope from Mount Shasta, in which the debris, the loose debris, such as the one seen in this picture, 
can travel several hundred, if not thousand feet from where it actually exists, littering the environment and contaminating the environment with whatever residual resides on the materials blowing in the wind. Sometimes the trash can be identified. Other times, it cannot. Parcel after parcel after parcel as trash left on site. Styrofoam, plastics, paper, used batteries, every site. So what happens to the trash left on the side when the organized criminal elements leave? Some of it may be carried away by animals. Some of it may fly in the air, littering the landscape. Others may try, may deteriorate on site. But let's look at this deterioration. Greenhouses are constructed on almost every parcel. They're constructed out of, of plastic, a heavier gauge than the plastic bags, but similar in construction which lasts from 10 to 1,000 years before it decomposes. On one site alone was 500 greenhouses. Some individuals living in the area have chosen to dig pits and, and burn their trash. This is both dangerous and toxic to the environment. We no longer have a fire department in the area due to the lowering water tables. In addition, all the toxins that are now being burned have a potential to enter the groundwater. Slashed, cleared to be able to make room for the greenhouses along with the trash has created a volatile environment for both the wildlife and humans alike. If a fire occurs, debris and trash piles will release contaminants in the air, landing on leafy material consumed by the wildlife and affecting the local community and air quality. This is traditionally a fire prone area. With current chemicals on the site, the following fumes are produced carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, chlorine gases. But we have no idea what the combination of these chemicals that sit side by side will produce. Nor do we know the explosive behavior of those chemicals when combined. We do know that there is a lot of chemicals out there that is flammable. It's dangerous to the individual on the ground that lives there. It's dangerous to the community. And even more so, it's dangerous to the responders. They're placed in harm's way. And the operations on these sites, we know of propane and butane being used. These are bombs for our responders. Even on one site, there were 600 butane fuel containers inventoried. Currently, we know that in the same time frame as last year to this year, we have five times more acreage being burned and twice as many fires occurring. There's over 3,000 sites in this aquifer. And these chemicals, this environmental consequence doesn't stay on that site. It travels. If we look at eight 55 gallon drums on each site as a rough estimate of what's out there, we have 1,320,000 gallons of chemical soup, a mixture of chemicals in this aquifer. As I stated previously, the contaminants won't stay on the site. They'll flow off site via the water, groundwater flow or runoff. And even when they get 
lower down in elevation towards the agricultural land, they will be pumped and, and potentially spread on the vegetation growing on site there. Between the contaminated growing sites and the last point in this aquifer is an elementary school. It goes from K to eighth grade with an adjacent daycare center. Children are in this environment for upward of 10 years. Arsenic naturally occurs in the water in this area. At that location, it's 5.1, 10 is the max. As the decrease in water, the increase in arsenic. But now we have a combination of chemicals. We do not know what this combination of chemicals and this arsenic will do to this school and its community. Less than two miles from the elementary school is another little stopping point. It's Salt Lake. It's a small lake that has migratory endangered species. They land, they get their food, and they move on to points unknown. The food source, the organism that, that grows in that little lake, may be affected by the contaminants in the groundwater. Another unknown, and an unknown to what's going to happen to the endangered species within this lake. As you can see on this slide, the water migrates down from Salt Lake to the Shasta River. This river is a spawning area for Chinook salmon and coho salmon and for an endangered species of trout. It's unknown how much contaminants will arrive at Shasta River, and it's unknown the effect that it's gonna have on the fish population of that river. Is this crime worth an environmental disaster? Is it worth all the wildlife devastated? Is it worth it? We think not. Nothing is worth harming the environment, nothing. But we cannot fight this alone. This battle can't be fought by one sheriff and by one county by itself. We need help. We need the state and the federal government to step in and help us, help us help our environment while we still have one to fight for.